ഹിമുസ്വത്തുസനിമൻകാനയർജുള്ളാഹവൽയോമിൽ Before I um, start with what we're going to talk about today, thank you so much for all your messages. I haven't replied them all. Inshallah, I will do so. This is my last majlis, as Nasima said. My sister-in-law is still struggling to get up after her operation. So if you can find it in your hearts, please do dua for her. And for all the other people who have texted to say they are either ill or ill, people they know are ill in hospitals can we have a salawat for them please allahumma salli ala muhammad wa ali muhammad wa ajjal farajhum we've been talking about memes and i said my last meme would be yesterday but maybe i should have extended it today so if you can ima- remember the 10 memes that we've talked about and i'll go on to them so you know them On the first day we talked about Muharram and everything that Muharram dealt with. The second day the meme was about Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad wa ajjil farajam. The third day we talked about the mother of the book Ummul Kitab which was Surah Al-Fatiha. On the fourth day we talked about forgiveness and I told you when I asked my children how do you say forgiveness with meme and they said maaf. so you can't forget that right on the 5th day we talked about friends or mates as far as meme is concerned on the 6th day it was mom and dad so that was a meme as well on the 7th day it was the main day of the week which is friday so again that's a meme on the 8th day we talked about salah which is a musalli musalli is one who prays um yesterday we talked about dua and it's mujib now today we talk about meat m for meat m w e t not the meat okay meat. because aitul bahajat says that when you go to a majlis don't say you're going to a majlis say you are going for the ziyara of aba abdullah now we're going to talk about tomorrow as in the day of ashura and i i said that today we would look at the amal of the day of ashura what we do why we do what we do do we just read what we're reading are we going go, going to go through each aspect of the amal of the day of Ashura and it's quite important we understand what we are doing. So when I say meet, we're coming here to meet say the shahada as such. The word ziyara comes from the Arabic word zawr. Zawr actually means to deflect, to turn away. So when you say you are doing somebody's ziyara, you are actually turning away from everything except Aba Abdullah. So tomorrow there's nothing we're going to do except go towards Abu Abdullah. I'm going to go through some ahadith so we understand the importance of what we're doing when we recite this um when we recite the ziyara in particular. So Imam Sadiq asks his companion Safwan, 
He says, whenever you, or when he actually tells him to start with, he said, when you are confronted with an adversity, then seek your solution from Imam Hussein with the ziyara. Whoever recites the ziyara from near or far, now there are loads of benefits. I've just taken a few. Their hajat are fulfilled. They get shafa'a. Jannah is made wajib, and you get immunity from Jahannam. It's not rocket science, and we need to understand what we're talking about here. There was a person called Mullah Muhammad Yazdi, and I do stories because that's what children like. That's all I am, I talk to kids. So Mullah Muhammad Yazdi says that he had a friend, and his friend was slightly questionable. He was a little bit worried about his friend who died, and he thought, oh my goodness, this guy could have been a better person. That was his thoughts, because he'd been with his friend a long time. And then he sees his friend in his dream, and his friend is laughing and smiling, and, and he thought, oh, maybe that's a license to be naughty. You know, I mean, his friend is smiling away. He said, what happened? He said, my God, it was so difficult when I went down there. They asked me for hisab, and I'm thinking, what if I did? And then suddenly, somebody was buried near me. And it was like there was noor, there was radiance everywhere, and all of us around this particular person, we had goodness. Everything was sorted. And he thought, who was it? Goes to Kabristan, because now you're, you, you, you want to know. And he goes there, and he finds that he's a woman who was the wife of somebody called Professor, it was Professor Haddad. So he thinks, I better go and find out. So he goes to him, gives his condolences, and he says, what was so special about your wife? He said, um, nothing really. She cooked, cleaned, looked after the children, looked after the house. He said, no, 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 no. Something must be there because of her. All those around her have been illuminated. So he said, well, I know one thing. Whenever she finished her work, she would go to the roof of the house and she would say, "Assalamu alayka ya Aba Abdullah. And she would read Ziyara Ashura. You know, I mentioned this in the first majlis. If you can't do any of that, any of that, at least before Salah, Assalamu alaikum ya Aba Abdullah. After Salah, Assalamu alaikum ya Aba Abdullah. When you're drinking water, Assalamu alaikum ya Aba Abdullah. When you're going to sleep, Assalamu alaikum ya Aba Abdullah. We do not understand the value. And I'll tell you why. The value is not in me saying Salam. But everybody knows that the answer to salam is wajib. Now you imagine Abu Abdullah telling you and me, wa alayki salam. And salam is phenomenal. Alama Tabatabai says it's the identity of a Muslim. And he says, when you say salam to somebody, you are saying, may you be encompassed in the mercy of Allah. Now maybe you and I are different, but can you imagine Imam telling you and me? that we are encompassed in the mercy of Allah. And if you have any doubts and you think, well, say the shahada was murdered on Ashura, Quran says in Surah Ali Imran, لا تحسبن الذين قتلوا في سبيل الله أموات. Don't even think of those who have given their lives in the way of Allah as dead. بَلَحْيَوْنِ in the رَبِّكُمْ They are alive with their Rabb. So when you and I say salam, it is the answer that is phenomenally important. You get stuck? Assalamu alaikum ya Aba Abdullah. It has a phenomenal effect. So Imam Khomeini mentioned Ayatollah Bahjat. Again, I will repeat the story which I mentioned on the first day. Ayatollah Bahjat narrates this, and you all know who Ayatollah Bahjat is, phenomenal scholar of our times. So he says there was this group of people who were going to Iran and to go to Mashhad, and on the way they picked up all the farmers who were there. One refused, said, I can't go. I can't leave my, my livestock, I can't leave my wife, I can't leave my children. It's difficult, they will not be able to look after it. And these people said, you're only worried about worldly things. Come on, you gotta, just come with us. Close everything and come with us. He says, I can't do that. And when they became so persistent, he turns towards Mashhad and he said, Assalamu alayka yabna Rasulullah. And the answer came, wa alayka salam. So you know for a moment when you say salam, pause, think. Just think, the answer is there. There's no way it's not going to come. So now this ziyara that we're going to read is made up of two things. It's made up of a salam and it's made up of la'ana. It's tawalla and tabarra. Now we may have learned about tawalla and tabarra in, in uh, madrasa or workshop when we were young. 
Tawalla actually means that you are going towards perfection. Because you and I want to be like the Ahlul Bayt. These are our role models. We want to run away from imperfection, which is tabarra. We want to actually move away. And that is what we call Yazidiyat. Now, in this day and age, it's easy. You've all heard of Daesh. You've all heard of ISIS, right? They call themselves Muslims, do they not? They say we want to go back to the time of the Prophet. They have got it all skewed. They are so harsh. They have no idea what Islam is. So when I say tabarra in my head, I don't want to be like them. I just don't. When I say tawalla, I want to be a Husseini. So Ziyara Ashura is all about tawalla and tabarra. Salam and la'na. And I'll explain la'na in a minute so we understand what it's talking about. Salam, like I said, is just phenomenal. Now there's one other thing. Most of us, on the day of Ashura, if somebody says salam, we say, oh, I can't reply. Really? Let me see what Zayd Zistani says. He says, Hada amalun ghayru sahih. Not saying salam and not answering is not sahih. It's not right. Where did we get this notion from? That you can't say salam. I remember when I used to come in here before and pre-COVID and hopefully now tomorrow, post-COVID, right? You say salam, they look at you and they say, Danitikche? Go, yeah. You need to answer my salam. And they say, we have to say this other thing. Yes, say that too. You can't say it in Arabic. Don't. All you are trying to say is that may Allah reward you for your grief. Now I'm going to paraphrase. May Allah reward you for your du'as. May, and you can do du'as on the day of Ashura. We'll talk about it in a minute. May he reward you for that. May he reward you for your sadness. But more than anything else, may he reward you in thinking, in pondering over the effects of injustice. Over the effects of what I have done to somebody else. It has a major effect. How am I going to get myself out of it? The only way I can do it is by being Husseini. Compassion, compassion, compassion. And we heard from Nasima just now. Forgiveness, forgiveness. Forgiveness. And that's what Hussein was about. And this is what this is about. So, first of all, definitely do salam. You've got to do it. And when we greet Imam with salam, I'll repeat again. Can you just imagine? This is from the Aimma. It's the reply from him that constitutes to the miraculous effect of the ziyara. When people say, what is the big deal? The big deal is that reply that you and I get back. Now, la'ana. Oh, my goodness. We all get a bit stuck. I have young people coming to me and says, I will read the ziyara, but I will not do la'na. Like, oh, maybe you haven't understood what la'na is. Because in our heads, because we read that translation, la'na says curse. And we don't like the word curse. La'na is a dua. It says, Ya Allah, I am asking you, not you, I and you cannot do anything. We are asking Allah to withdraw his mercy from these people. When I say withdraw his mercy, mercy is guidance. Who is the most merciful in your li life? Your mama. And who tells you off the most? Your mama. And if she doesn't tell you off, there's something wrong with her. Okay? Brush your teeth. Go and pray. Do this. Do that. And it just goes on and on and on. Why? Because nobody will care as much as her. So when you... La, mars, mercy, Rahma is guidance. So you're saying, Ya Allah, withdraw your guidance. Now, we're going to read Surah Al Hazab. I'm going to go into the, the um, if I can look at it, maybe into the short sections of it. But in Surah Al Hazab, let's look at what Allah says. Those who, you Allah, who hurt Allah and His Messenger. Allah will withdraw his mercy from them in the dunya and the akhirah. This is Quran. Okay? So now let me look at Rasulullah. If I ask Rasulullah and I say, Ya Rasulullah, who do you love? He would say, Al Fatima to bid'atu minni. Fatima is a part of me. Did he not say, Husaynu minni wa ana minal Hussein? So there is nothing wrong in me using these words and saying la'na on those who hurt Rasulullah, right? Quran, you can look it up. Surah An-Nisa, ayah 118. There is la'na on shaitan because he refused to acknowledge the prophethood of Prophet 
Adam. Maybe you can look it up in your home. Um, Surah Al-Ma'idah, Ayah 60, there's La'nan and Ashabu Sabt, because they broke the covenant of Allah. You can look up these words, and maybe you can put it in your search, en search engine, and you'll find it. But La'ana does not mean abuse. You cannot abuse anyone. Incidentally, in this, this country, if you abuse somebody, you can be taken to court for slandering. You know that. So don't even try. Okay? But Quran says, and this is Surah number 6, Ayah 108. Look it up. Surah Al-An'am. Allah says, لا تصب الذين يدعون من دون الله فيصب الله عدوا بغير الله Don't abuse those who worship other than Allah for fear that in their ignorance they will abuse Allah. You and I are not allowed to abuse. Anyone, absolutely anyone, no abuse. La'ana is different. It's a dua asking Allah to withdraw his mercy. So now I'm going to go through the whole day of tomorrow. How are we going to start the day? What are we going to do? And we're going to look at the amal and hopefully we will understand. Those of you who have a book, please make notes in it. My book is full of notes. I'm old-fashioned. I like books. Young people like things on their phone. I don't have my phone with me. But... I think at the moment we have a little bit of issues in finding all the books that we had pre-COVID. I think they're upstairs and you can't go upstairs because you might fall through, right? So please download the book. It will be on a PowerPoint, but download the book onto your phones. We've got the book on qfatima.com. I'm sure you find it other places as well, but at least it's available. Download it and keep it ready so you can recite it. Inshallah, we'll do the amounts together in the, in the ladies' marquee. So let's set the scene. So you're greeting each other with salam and a'adhamallahu ujurana wa ujurakum bimasaibul Hussein. Um, you're feeling sad. Why? Because you're pondering over the detrimental effects of oppression and the detrimental effects of the ego. Because my and your ego says, I want things my way or the highway. Then if you look at your amal sheet, it tells you, recite Surah Al-Ikhlas a thousand times. It's okay, 10 times, five times, a hundred times. But Surah Al-Ikhlas is there to remind you and me that everything revolves around divinity. Allah, one, Allah. We neither worship the Alams, or we neither worship the Shabis, or we neither worship any of the Ma'asumin. Our worship is solely for Allah. Often we get accused. Ah, your worship. We're not. We know. That is why on the day of Ashura, you start off with Suratul Ikhlas. Absolute, pure Tawheed. Don't let anybody fool you in any other way. Then you have, you are, you're recommended to say, Allahumma lan katilata. You read that, don't you? Allahumma lan katilata al Hussein alayhi his salah. Thousand times? Doesn't matter. Ten times. Why? Because you're saying la'ana on those who killed Imam Hussein. Let me just give you a little bit of an example. 30,000 Muslims on the other side. Yes? 30,000. Out of which, 130 were half the Quran. 130 Sahaba who had seen the Prophet actually condoned the killing of Imam Hussein. This is what they did. They were completely desensitized. When you say, Allahumma al-an, you and I are saying, Ya Allah, I do not want to be like those for whom mercy was withdrawn. Now today, and I'm just giving an example. As you walked in, and I walked in through these few days, there was a stand outside that said, Ali Asghar appeal, did it not? Fool ni to fool ni pankri. If not the flower, a petal, give them a pound, give them whatever you can manage. Because we are no different from those who denied this little child water. We help. Anybody who is able to help them. I'm not here to plug them. Rukaya did a beautiful job yesterday. But it's just here to say that these are the sort of things that will help us along, that tell us that we've actually understood what this is about. Then we have a four rakat salah. In the first two rakats, we have kafirun and ikhlas. Kafirun and ikhlas are known as mukashkish. I repeat again, they are known as mukashkish. If you find you are ill, you are hurt, things are hurting you, read kafirun and ikhlas. Kafirun, if you look at the focus of kafirun, it's the identity of a Muslim. Do you know, you and I are identified by one sentence, la ilaha. Illallah. Yes, Muhammadur Rasulullah Aliyun 
Waliullah. But our Tawheed is La ilaha illallah, which Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam taught us, right? So, kafirun is La ilaha. Because you say, Lakum dinukum waliya, din, no gods. And then, illallah is ikhlas. Because it is actually an exposition of wahdaniyat. It tells you who Allah is. I repeat again, when you recite these two surahs, you're back to knowing that the reason Imam Hussain stood there was for me and you to learn la ilaha illallah. On that note, I get loads of messages where children tell me, but we stayed awake so late at night at the mosque, we can't pray Salatul Fajr. Is that okay? Because we did, um, we did azadari. No, it's not okay. It's not okay, because this is why he stood there for you and me to understand what la ilaha illallah was all about, to drag my children to, and please bring your children to the mosque, make them sleep in the afternoon, they've got holidays these days. But if you brought them and you thought it was a good excuse that they cannot wake up for fajr, then there's something wrong with the way we've understood Hussein ibn Ali, right? The next two surahs are, oh, now here we have a problem, ahazab and munafikun. And I know because I recite Ahzab in Salah every Ashura except for the last two years. And my goodness, when Ahzab comes, people go, Ahzab? Really? Okay, so now we're going to talk about Ahzab. Okay? Suratul Ahzab, what is the focus? By the way, it's 33. You can't forget it, right? I don't know how you're going to remember it, but 33, Ahzab. So the first thing you've got to know about each surah is what is it talking about? And I'm going to briefly divide it into two sections. In other words, two focuses. We've divided it into five sections, but two focuses. The first is external, the second is internal. So the Prophet had two major problems in his head. An external problem and a domestic problem. The external problem was the Battle of Ahzab. Read about in history, I don't have time, otherwise I'd have gone into it. But basically what happened in the Battle of Ahzab was all the different little, little, little communities around, all the little tribes around, gathered together to come and attack Medina and get rid of the Muslims one and once and for all. So you have a major problem. It was probably the most difficult time for the Prophet, Battle of Ahzab. So outside you've got this problem. Internally there's a domestic issue. What is the domestic issue? First of all, what happens is that the Prophet has an adopted son called Zayd. He adopts Zayd, right? He convinces Zayd to get married to Zainab. Zainab is the prettiest woman in the land. Gets married to Zainab. Prophet convinces him, he marries. They don't get on. Life is difficult for them. So they get divorced. Quran directs the Prophet to marry Zainab. Who does he marry? His adopted son's wife. And Quran directs it. Allah directs it. Allah sanctifies that marriage. So guess what happened to the people? They start talking. And Quran tells you, stop talking. I sanctioned it. If you want to gossip, then do the zikr of Allah. That is basically what Surah al hazab is about. It's telling you there will be pressure from outside. There will be pressure from inside. Solution, zikr of Allah. And then there are other ayat in here that you and I should know. One of them is, Inna Allaha wa malaikatahu yusalluna alan nabi. Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu, sallu alayhi wa sallimu taslima Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad wa ajil faraj and that in Surah Al-Azab 33, 33 is inna ma yuridu Allahu li yuthib anu muritsa ahl al-bayt wa yutahhirakum tathira Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad wa ajil faraj these are in Surah Al-Azab we need to know tomorrow inshallah you will get your um, Qur'ans out. And if you use your phones, you can even highlight on phones these days, right? There are many apps that allow you to do that. Highlight these ayat because you recite them every day. When it comes to salawat, Inna Allah wa malaikatahu Allah and the angels, wa malaikatahu yusalluna alan nabi. They send salawat on the Prophet. Or you will believe you do the same. Where in the world will you be able to say, I do what Allah does. I do what the angels do. Nowhere. Except in salawat. And that thus we have salawat is phenomenal. You're getting bored? Well, they used to be coving here. Don't count the coving. Don't count the staples that are on there. Count salawat. 
How many salawats am I going to recite? You're getting bored, do that. Okay, so we've divided the surah into five parts. Again, the same thing we talked about. We talked about five in a lot of things. So, five parts. The first one was, there is no such thing as zihar. Remember we talked about Surah Al-Mujadila, where, where, where the Arabs used to say, you are like my mama. I won't divorce you, but you're like my mom. I have no relationships with you, but you'll still cook and clean and do everything else for me. So this starts off by saying, no zihar, nothing, that's not happening. Adopted sons cannot be attributed to anybody but their biological fathers. And he talks about the status of the wives of the Prophet. That's section one. Section two is, in, es in essence, the commentary of the Battle of Ahzab. I'm not going to go into it. Section three is post-Ahzab. Now see what happens in post-Ahzab. So Ahzab is won by the... Muslims. It was also known as the Battle of the Ditch. You know Salman Farsi? Yes, you heard about it. So post Ahzab, things become better. Economic situation in Makkah becomes better. And the wives of the Prophet say, uh, can you increase our budget, please? We need a little bit more money now. Everybody seems to be doing well. And they are told, you're not like the rest of other people. You're not like the rest of women. You're different. If you want the Akhirah, then you will not be like others. And we will read it when you read the Dua. It tells them, don't beautify yourself for the public. Ayah 33 is in here, which I talked about just now. And it's in this section that Allah sanctions the marriage of himself with Zainab. And he says, after this, you will have no more wives. So that was it. Khalas, okay? Section 4 talks about the wives of the Prophet. And finally, Section 5 is beautiful because it focuses totally on the Prophet. So please recite it. Please look at it. On the website, we have the different buildings over the different sections. Download it. Have a look. Stick it in your book if you want. Now, the second surah we recite is Suratul Munafikun in the second, in the second ayah. Uh, second uh, uh, Rakat, sorry. So first two rakats, you've got kafirun and ikhlas, then you've got ahzab and munafikun. And munafikun is in essence an overview of hypocrisy. You cannot, and I repeat, you cannot point a finger at anyone and say, oh, you're a hypocrite. Uh -uh. This surah was there for me to manage myself, look into myself and say, where do I stand? The prophet sitting with his ashab, with his companions, and he's saying, I'm really worried about you. And they say, Ya Rasulullah, why are you worried about us? We're good. We believe. We pray, we fast, we go for hajj, we give comes. Maybe in our times they would say, we come to the mosque. Right? And he said, I'm still very, very worried about you. I'm worried about hypocrisy. And they say, Ya Rasulullah, why? He said, because it will creep into you like a black ant on a black stone on a black night. So for you and me, it's a tick box. Let me look and see what we're supposed to do. So we've divided the surah into two parts. I'll repeat again. The legitimacy of those who killed Abu Abdullah was signed by companions of the Prophet who had memorized the Quran. There was a kind of mob mentality. Did you know that he who killed Imam Ali, Ibn Mulchim, you heard him, right? He was one of the best Qaris of the time. His Quran was phenomenal. Yazid was known as the most intelligent man in Arabia. These people all recited Quran, they were intelligent, they prayed, they fasted, all the rest of it. Yet they signed this. So Quran tells me, you look at what you're all about. Look at yourself. See if you've got hypocrisy in you. And now here we have eight different qualities. And I'm going to go into them because we're going to read about them. The first one is that you go out to take pictures of yourself with the Prophet. They didn't say pictures that you're connected to the Prophet. So in my language and your language, selfies on the Musalla, selfies with the Kaaba, selfies I'm wearing black in Muharram, sorry, okay? That is going out of your way. Look what I'm doing, I'm really pious, that sort of thing. Number two, they use Islam as a shield. Islam against Islam. Hey, moms do that a lot, have you seen that? Didn't I tell you, you have to listen to your mom, otherwise khalas. And it could be something, anything. Okay, so they use Islam against Islam. The third thing, Iman is like a tube light. He didn't say tube light, huh? it says fluctuating hearts. You know what tube light is like? That's a tube light, okay? In East Africa, we used to have a lot of these everywhere, so you could see things properly. No candlelight dinners in East Africa, okay? It's tube light, okay. Now, if the starter went wrong, do you know what happens? It flickers. 
So Allah says their iman flickers. One day we believe, I call, I call myself and I look at it in my own heart, maybe we're Muharram and Ramadan Muslims. And then we forget. That's what Quran talks about. That's number three. Number four, they have a hollow spiritual inside, but their words, my goodness, they have gift of the gab. Now I can talk for hours. Okay. Number five, when you tell them, do we stick fire? It's the Prophet says, come. They turn their heads and they say, me? I haven't done anything wrong. So there's a level of pride which says, I don't need to do istighfar. Nobody needs, I don't need istighfar. Number six, very, very stingy. You ask them for anything. They won't give it. Not only that, they will make such a loud noise. Why do you want it? Where is it going? How are you going to give it? They will not give. They just don't give. Right? They also discourage, number seven, those who want to give. And finally, they hate immigrants or emigrants. Now, when those came to Medina, they said they've taken our jobs. Um, there's, it's an economic disaster. We'll send them to Rwanda. Anyway, sorry. <laughs> okay. And this is what they did. They didn't want to share. They just didn't want to share. So these are the qualities of those who have hypocrisy. And you know what? We need to look into ourselves. First ourselves. Don't have to look outside. So why does it happen? The surah is divided into two parts. And it gives you what happens, the greatest cause of hypocrisy. It says, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu, or you who believe, la tulhikum amwalukum wa la awladukum an dhikril. Do not allow your wealth and your children to move you away from the remembrance of Allah. There are two things that cause hypocrisy. One is wealth and one is children. Because we get so engrossed, we don't know what to do. And then he says the remedy. This is the remedy. Give in the way of Allah before death comes to you and you will say for your kulu, Rabbi Lola Akharatani ila Ajalin. Kari, please give me a little bit of time. Don't take me away just now. A little bit of time for asaddaka wa akuminas salihin. So I will give sadaka and I will become and I'll become of the righteous. And they will be told, Kalla, these are only words that you're talking about. So I repeat again. We have eight qualities. Number one. Number two, it's because we get so engrossed in our worldly life and there's no harm in being looking after your jobs, about your money, all the rest of it. But there's a limit. It needs to be balanced with spirituality. And children, I, I said this once, I repeat again. When you've done your best with your children and they've become adults, there's not much you can do except be their moms. That's what you can do. They will come back. They were given free will for a reason. But to be so engrossed that it's all you worry about, you forget about who you are. And that's what Quran says. That's what hypocrisy is all about. So we have these two surahs. We talked about ziyara, which was tawalla and tabarra. But one thing I'd like to talk about from the ziyara. Now, you know, we forget sometimes. And yesterday we talked about kunut. So take some extracts from this ziyara. And I'll pick my favorite bits. I'm sure you will have your favorite bits. But there are two that are absolutely right. One of them is, Allahumma mahyaya mahya Muhammadin wa ali Muhammad. Wa mamati mamata Muhammadin wa ali Muhammad. And use it in your kunut. Ya Allah. Grant me the ability to have the life of Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. And to die like the death of Muhammad wa ali Muhammad, the other one that I quite like, Allahumma j'alni indaka wajihan bil Hussein alayhi salam. Let me be those who is on the path of, in other words, Ya Allah, make me Husseini. So these are things you can use in your kunut. Now, after we finish the ziyara, we recite a dua called Dua al Alkama. Dua al Alkama was taught by Imam Sadiq to his companion. It's called Alkama bin Muhammad Hazari, and therefore it got, it, it's got known as Dua al Kama. We don't have time to talk about it, but there are some absolutely phenomenal sentences in Dua'i al -Kama. So just look at the first few sentences. If you've got them with you, look at them, and I'll go over them with you. Ya mujib da'watil muzdarreen. Oh, the one who replies to the one whose insides are hurting. 
You know, I said in Gujarati, absuk. And in English we say, there's discomfort going on. Ya qashifa karbil makrubin, or one who removes the anguish from the grieved. Ya ghiathal mustaghithin. And I told you what istighatha was. When there's a drought and people pray for rain, it is called istighatha. Ya sariq al mustasrakin, or the one who gives relief to those who cry out for help. Wa ya man huwa aqrabu min habl al warid. This is from Surah Al Qaf. Or one who is nearer to me than my jugular vein. Wa ya man yahulu bain al mar wa kalbi. Or he who comes between a human being's heart and his thought process. So these are just the first few I've taken. It's about seven of the first few bits of Dua al Alkama. But it's a beautiful du'a to read, not only on the day of Ashura, but whenever you want. And when we finish that, we go seven times up and down. Ridham bi kadha'ihi wa taslima li amri. And we'll talk about it when you talk about Ali al-Askar. And finally, we have Ziyarat al-Tazia, which is the Ziyara of condolence. And if you look at that ziyara, you're actually giving condolences to the Prophet, to Imam Ali, to Sayyidah Fatima, Imam Hassan, and to Imam Hussein. But I'd like to end in English with a dua, and I'll repeat a lot of it in Gujarati. Um, a dua that we recite ten times. And I remember this dua was taught to me by Marwan Mullah Asker, and he scribbled it down on a piece of paper. But now, in most of the books that you have, we've put it on the front cover. So please remember this if you forget everything else. Allahumma inni as'aluka. Oh Allah, I ask you, bihaqqil Hussein. In the name of Hussein, wa jaddihi and his grandfather, wa abihi and his father, wa ummihi and his mother, wa akhihi and his brother. This is the, what we call the panjatan. That is why your children are born and you say, Ya Muhammad, Ya Ali, Ya Fatima, Ya Hassan, Ya Hussein. If you forget all that, oh Allah, I ask you in the name of these five. What are we asking? Farij anni ma'anafi. Can you please take away the difficulty I'm in at the moment? Whatever is bothering you, take it away. Bi rahmatika ya arhamar rahimin. Take away the anguish that's inside me. And all too often, Allah sends a person. I will repeat what I told you about Prophet Musa. And please take help when it comes. I told you about Prophet Musa running up with a tummy ache on top of the mountain and saying, and this doctor halfway saying, Ya Musa, you look in pain, can I help you? Uh uh, don't want you, I want God. When he goes up, my tummy's hurting, he said, I sent you a doctor. He didn't go down, didn't take help. So here, when we do this dua, he sends someone. And we're Ahlul Baytis, for God's sakes. We look at each other, we help each other, and it takes us through. That, in essence, is what tomorrow is about. It's about actually thinking, who am I? Where do I want to go? Do I want to go like this to Allah? Can I ask for forgiveness? I remember as a child, every Ashura, as we used to walk out of the, of the mosque, there was this man. And he would give out these pieces of papers. And remember, at that time, there was no photocopiers. It wasn't like we have it today. You could actually print out hundreds of copies. But he used to give handwritten copies. And if you read that, most people took the copy and put it in the bin, right? But if you read the copy, it said, please forgive me for whatever I've done. And we used to look at this and we say, yeah, yeah, okay. But you said yes. Because inside of you, you said yes, right? And I also remember that the year after, when I even learned how to read, the year after he died, and on Ashura, you missed him because he stood outside. So maybe I will take this opportunity today to ask on behalf of all of you to ask each other, because they say in Gujarati, tham hoi to khakre. You know, when you live together, you're bound to have issues. So forgive each other. If you can't forgive each other, go and tell them, I can't forgive you, give me this. Or recite ten salawats for me. I don't know, okay? But it's important to start the day of Ashura on that basis. So can we have a salawat? Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad wa ajil faraja. So on the day of Ashura, we have this mama. She raises her hand. She raises her hands in dua and she looks at her child. Her child has not had any drink as such. There are riwayah that says maybe the day before she was able to feed him, to nurse him a little. This is a six-month-old child. Even today, six-month-old children only have 
milk from their mamas. They're nourished by their mom. And there are riwaya that says maybe she fed her child yesterday, but you and I know that if you leave a child even for a few hours without milk, that child cries and cries and cries and then has no strength at all. So this mom is looking at her child. And this child has got no strength. This child is in the, in the cradle. And talk about mom for two minutes. Mom is the daughter of Imra al Qais. He was Arab nobility, he was a Christian. And he accepted Islam during the Khilafah of, um, I think it was of Omar. So she accepts Islam. Imam Ali, this is his akhlaq, this is his compassion. He goes to his house to welcome them into the folds of Islam. And immediately when he sees Imam Ali, he has three daughters. He says, Ya Ali, I give my Maliha to you. I give my Salma to Hassan. And I will give my rabab to Hussein. She was one of the most intelligent women in Medina. She was a poet. She was phenomenally intelligent. And Imam used to say, these are his words, I swear, this is Imam, I love the house in which rabab and Sakina are living. I love them dearly. I sacrifice all my belongings to them and no one, no one after meeting them can disapprove of my admiration towards them. That was rabab. And this is this rabab who on the day of Ashura looks at her child and she says, Ya Allah, give him life so he is useful to you. And she's talking about a six-month-old baby. I want him to live forever, she says. Then Imam Hussain al-Islam goes to Tila Zainabiyah and he says, Hal min nasri yansurna, hal min mughithin yughithuna. Is there anyone to help us? Is there anyone who will respond to our cries of help? And Rabab starts crying. He goes back to the tent. Rabab, why are you crying? I am still here. She says, Mawla, look at this baby. He didn't have strength. But he threw himself out of his cradle, Mawla. Imam says, Maybe I can quench his thirst. Imam takes this baby in his arms. He covers him with his abaya. The sun is harsh. The sun of Arabia at 12 o'clock is not an easy one. Midday, he takes this baby. As he's walking towards the army of Yazid, they say, Hussein is coming. Hussein has got the Quran with him because he's got something under his abaya. Imam faces the army and he says, if I am guilty in your eyes, if I am the one whom you do not like, this baby has done you no wrong. This baby is thirsty. Please, could you give some water to this baby? This baby needs some water. He says, okay, nobody moves. He says, okay, I'll put this baby on the hot sand of Karbala. I sometimes wonder how Imam did this. Maybe he laid his cloak out. How did he put that child on that sand? He said, I lay this child on this sand. I won't go near him. I won't take your water. There were fathers in that army. Their hearts moved. They took their water bags and they were going towards Furat. Ibn Ziyad tells Hurmala, Iqtal kalam al Hussein, kill the words of Hussein. Imam sees that nobody is coming. He picks up this child in his arms. Hurmala lifts an arrow, a three-pronged arrow used to kill camels. The first arrow falls. When it falls, Ibn Ziyad says, you scared of a baby? He says, no. He says, from the tents I can see the mama watching me. Even I have a heart. In some riwayah it says, say the Fatima appears towards him and says, Hurmala, what has this child done to you? He picks up the second arrow because he sees Ibn Ziyad, he's desensitized. And he pins the child to Imam Hussein. Imam looks at this baby who is smiling and says, I will go like this in front of my mama. <laughs> Imam, he wants to take this child back to his mother. Seven times he walks back and forth. I am pleased with your order, Ya Allah. I am at peace with you. Imagine for a moment, this is a father taking his child back to his mom. Eventually, he takes the child back to his mom. 
when mom takes one look at the child, she says, Asghar? Asghar? If I knew that they killed soldiers like you, I would have dressed you in an armor, Asghar. Mama picks up the baby. They go behind the tent. With his sword, Baba t- digs, a, digs a little grave. Mama places her baby into the grave. Baba closes the grave and she says, I don't have any water, Asghar, but I will use my tears to wet your grave. Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi rajiun. Sayyalamun alladheena dalamu ayyabud kalibiyan let us pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us the tawfiq to be able to understand tomorrow, to be able to ponder over the oppression that happens. And may Allah give those who oppress hearts to understand what they're doing to the oppressed. Let us pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that in the name of Ali Asghar, there are so many children in the world who are thirsty. There are so many children who don't get food. There are so many children who are orphans. Ya Allah, please grant them the najat that they so deserve. Rabbana taqabbal minna inna ka anta sami'u alayhi.